off, do people realize how much money there is in paper products in this country? When you think about it, toilet paper, paper plates, paper cups, um, there is towels, paper towels, right? How, like how much are we using just to dry our hands or wipe our behinds, right? These are, we use so much of it. And yet here we have this extremely versatile plant that grows like a weed that is, that doesn't, is not damaging to our planet. And yet we're not utilizing it based on what? I want to express that it's not only da not damaging to the planet, Mama Aki, it actually restores and repairs our super fun sites, our nuclear waste sites, our chemical spill sites. And it puts the nutrients I'm off, I'm back. Off in. I'm off my own channel because you know what? This it, it's like, why aren't we funding this? And the primary reason, oh, do not let me go onto a rant on my own show because this is, let me sit back down. So my guest for today is Joey Peltier. He is a water protector, local and national organizer, works with Seven Circle Alliance as a project developer. So also work with Honor Earth, Indigenous Environment Network and M MN350 as an organizer. So thank you so very much. Introducing Joey Peltier. So good to have you on the channel and finally with me. Anin Buju JB. Um, Ernest Joseph Uppergard Peltier the third Indigenous Ka Makadewa Makandunja Mandunjana Ba Makanakwa Jiji Niniwek. Oofta. I know that was a mouthful. Um, what I just said there is hi, hello, I'm Joey Peltier. I'm from the Black Bear clan of the Turtle Mountain Banna Nishinaabe over in North Dakota, and I live here in Bemidji, Minnesota. And yeah, I am a project developer for a new project within the Seven Circles Alliance. And a little touch on, on what we're doing there is we are organizing around a project for the general strike. So I'm excited. We just had a, a we just had a call with Mr. Chris Smalls and a, a Mr. Steven Donzinger last week. Don't don't share that too loud. But uh oh, I'm here to uh, give a good conversation about hemp and what we are doing with our hemp industry now and where it has came from. So thank you, uh, JB, for having me on. I'm excited. If your viewers remember me, I'm always in Savvy's chat or um, in the call-in shows with Sabrina. So I'm glad to be here with J uh, JB. Great. Thank you so very much as well. Uh, and so one of the things that I wanted to start off with, uh, you know, uh, of course, as an Indigenous activist, you are... Uh, in tune with the land. I like to think of people who are indigenous to the land as the stewards of the land, people who know, you know, the land and how it operates. And I, I was with some comrades uh, over the weekend, and I liken it to like this. Um, it's like when you meet somebody that lives in a home and they know all the, you know, the background of how things work. Like, uh, you would want to keep that person in the house and you will want to learn from that person how the home works. But unfortunately, because of the country that we live in, because of the system that we, we live in, the attendants of the house have largely either been kicked out or... The ongoing so genocide is real. Exactly. And so... It is similar to what's going on in Gaza has happened over the last 500 years here. So as far as, uh, you know, your experience with uh, dealing with the occupier your entire life. Come on, they're colonizers. Uh, the colonizers, yeah. 
uh, dealing with the, the colonizers. How has that, uh, how has that influenced, you know, your views? Uh, I think it's kind of an easy question, but how has that influenced your views to where you are now? Just I see I just... myself differently from a lot of our other climate organizers. Um, when you talk about indigenous resistance, you're, you're talking about the connection to that land. And I, I'm yeah. glad that you brought that up. I remember it was uh, December 2021 when we started the battle for Line 3 Boots on the Ground. And it was my elder in training, um, Don Goodwin's birthday. And she decided to trespass. She didn't decide. The Monadus, the, the spirits, called for her to protect our medicine and uh, to go on to the construction site and to go grab and remove some of the medicine that was laying there on the ground to, to make sure it wasn't trampled over. And, you know, when I when I say medicine, you know, those are things that we use to heal ourselves, our spirits and our, our community. And, and to my elder in training, that medicine was a branch, you know, it, it was actual cedar on the ground, which we use in our ceremony. When I think about myself as an organizer, I have to constantly remember that I am indigenous first. And when I go into action, when I go into organizing spaces, I'm actually participating in ceremony itself because that, that is rooted within our culture, within our spirituality. So this is not just a, oh, hey, Joe's a millennial, so let's go save the world. This is, Joe has a calling from the Monadus, the great spirits that directs me to take care of my community, take care of our, our you know, four-legged relatives and take care of the, the environment around us. And which gets me into the conversation on hemp. JB, I love hemp. And folks that know my sister and I, because we typically roll together, um, we have been talking about hemp for a good solid decade now and telling people how revolutionary this plant is and how much it could save our earth. A mama a key. And oh man, the hemp itself. Did you know, JB, that hemp can take radioactive material, nuclear material, and after a few crops, it can make that radioactive material inert. It can clean up radio met or uh, nuclear mess. Yeah, and we can easily make that that hemp into products that we could use in our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on that here in a moment, but do you have any starting out questions before I get deep into this? Yes, I actually have. Um, the first question is for many people who may be listening, because uh, I try not to judge because some people just don't know, what is hemp? Mm. Well, I was talking to you on the, or before we jumped in the show and I told you I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world. I'm your average Joe. And I don't know too much about the good science around hemp, but I do know from the, you know, what we pulled up in, in research for this uh, podcast is that it is not a psych, psychotropic. It, it's not connected to that strain of cannabis. And it, it's, it's just another form of cannabis that doesn't have the THC, the, the CBD, to the extent that it makes you get hot, you know, a buzz off of. I'm trying to be careful on what I say on YouTube. Thank you, because they're, they're ridiculous. But thank you so very much for that. Uh, so as far as uh, that is concerned, and I also have some... I also have some things that I, I also want to bring up as well. But as far as hemp goes, there are, I, I heard that there's over 50,000 different uses just for hemp alone. I could and, imagine that. I, I could imagine that. And actually, we're going to be talking about some of those uses for hemp. And, you know, maybe 
conversations around how it's not as beneficial in that circumstance as in others. You know, it, it's all how it's produced and it, it's all how it's broken down. Okay. All right. So uh, are you ready to show the slide? Oh, let's go. All right. Let's get into it. Let's see. All right. So this is the slide that you have. Let's get into it. Okay. Give me one moment. Let me make sure everything's working on my side. Mm -hmm. Bam. Okay. Hemp is one of the oldest industries on our planet, going back more than 10,000 years to the beginning of pottery. You know, Columbia history of the world states that the oldest relic of the human industry is just this little itty bitty piece of hemp fabric that dates back over 8,000 BC. Um, right? So, um, you may not have realized, but hemp has actually played a significant role within the early histories of America. Hemp impacted our colonial economy, which cannot be o or overstated. It has one of the most valuable crop. It was one of the most valuable crops grown in the Americas. Hemp was a cash crop in high demand due to its versatility and usefulness. During the colonial period, hemp was primarily used for rope making sales, clothing, you know, that basic stuff. The, the strong fibers in that hemp plant makes, makes it really ideal for these purposes. And as a result, the production became a major industry within our colonies. Some of the colonies even passed laws requiring our farmers to grow hemp to support the economy. Going way back, President Washington and Jefferson both grew hemp. And during that time, Americans were legally bound to grow hemp during the colonial era and the early Republic. It was such an integral part of America. You could, you know, for the past, or for about 50, or excuse me, for about 150 years, pay your taxes with hemp. That boggled my mind when I pulled that out. I was like, wait, I do contract work. I, I, I kind of owe some taxes because of, you know, they don't take it out with the paycheck. So like, can I pay, can I, you know, barter some hemp? I'm indigenous here. Let's, let's do some bartering. Anywho, we, they don't allow that anymore. Um, oh, during, oh, man. right. <laughs> during the 18th century hemp popularity surge, it became the backbone for our economy. It was, it deeply rooted in the fabric of our lives. Hemp was, you know, as I said, used for clothing and many of our farmers growing the crop to supply the demands for textiles. The versatility of the plant was woven into fabrics for clothing, providing sustainable and cost effective alternatives to importing from, you know, England. You know, it took a long time to get stuff over. Um, this allowed for development of a domestic textile industry and reduced the dependency on foreign imports, strengthening our economy here. The technological advancements of the day also played a significant role in the hemp boom. Um, innovations in farming techniques, the machinery allowed for the increased cultivation and processing of hemp. Um, there were machines such as the hemp brake and a scrooching machine that made the production of hemp fibers even more efficient and cost effective. Uh, there's this dude back in the early 1900s, late 1800s named Rudolf Diesel. And yeah, that's the dude that made the diesel engine. He designed it to run on vegetable and seed oils like hemp. It actually ran on peanut oil for the 1900 world or excuse me what? 1900 world fair yeah it ran on peanut oil oh man it was brilliant and uh wow. okay. you know the american car manufacturer henry ford we'll get a little bit more into that later but he not only constructed his cars out of hemp he also filled them but I unfortunately saw that. Yeah, unfortunately, by the time he got his first one made, the regulations were hammered out and it, it made it pretty much stagnated the whole industry. Talking about that, when they made hemp illegal, that was 1937. Congress passed the Marijuana 
um, Tax Act. Let me see if I can scroll a little bit on here. I'm sorry. I'm new to Prezi, so uh, we're just going to mm-hmm. bypass a couple of these slides. Bam. Okay. So in 1937, Congress passed that Marijuana Tax Act, which effective, or, yeah, effectively began the era of hemp prohibition. The tax and licensing regulations um, of the act made hemp cultivation difficult for American farmers. The chief promoter of the tax act is this douche, uh, excuse me, this uh, colonizer, Henry Asslinger. Um, if I butchered the name, I, I'm not really uh, sorry for that. He began promoting anti-marijuana legislation, not just here in the United States, but he went across the world to lock it down. Um, the the tax act of the 1937 was fueled by uh, politics and racial motivation. It effectively prohibited the cultivation and the sale of hemp throughout the United States. It lumped hemp together with marijuana. I'm sorry, Jay. Um, and psychoactive variants of the cannabis plant, leading to a misconception that the hemp was also a dangerous drug. This misconception combined with the rise of the synthetic fibers like nylon, furthering contribute to the decline of hemp as a viable industry. The prohibition um, had a significant impact on our farmers who relied on hemp as you know a, a cash crop for them. They were forced to find alternative sources of income. Many of them went bankrupt um, this was during the, the, the Great Depression, the Dust Pole era. So they, they were hurting when we made these changes, leading into financial struggles for a lot of these farmers. Additionally, the ban on hemp hindered innovation and technology advancements in the industry to make hemp into uh, raw material, into products. One moment to catch myself up on these. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm a little bit new to Prezi. I love it. it it's very beautiful um bam okay we hit the tax act okay along comes world war ii the japanese attack on pearl harbor shut off foreign supplies of jewel fiber which is colloquial known as manila hemp from the philippines the usda produced a film called hemp for victory to encourage u.s hemp farmers to grow hemp for the war effort. And if you ever check out that video, oh man, it is kind of funny. It, it, it's black and white, so you know it, it's old timey. But I, I encourage everyone, just check it out. Our, our, our American government pushed out this video to help us produce hemp for World War II. After the, the war ended, the government quietly shut down all of the processing plants and the industry faded away again. The loss of the hemp industry also had its cultural repercussions as the knowledge and skills associated with the cultivation and process were lost over time. Um, During the period from the 1937 to the late 60s, the US government understood and actually freaking acknowledged that uh, that the hemp industry, the industrial hemp and marijuana were distinct varieties of the cannabis plant. And hemp was no longer officially recognized as this distinct difference from uh, from the other strain after the passage of the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. Bam. The Hemp Industry Association Semin... uh, Oof, that's a big word. The Hemp Industry Association Seminar, sem, uh, skipping it, of uh, 2001 Seminole. and, thank you, Seminole, of mm-hmm. 01 and 03 federal court cases um, reestablished the distinction between the varieties of cannabis at a federal level, laying the groundwork for the reintroduction of the hemp industry for uh, 2014 and the 2018 farm bills. Um, And as we know, 2014, when we started inching towards the legalization of hemp again, President Obama signed the Farm Bill, allowing research groups 
and institutions to start a pilot program for hemp farming. A lot of those pilot programs, you know, I'm, I'm actually from North Dakota originally. We had one of those pilot programs right outside of Fargo, Moorhead. And it was uh, a few acres, it was gated, and it was ran by the NDSU, which is the North Dakota University System. And I was shocked, astonished, and it's pretty cool to think about, you know, just we had fields of hemp over there. Mm, I love it. Wow. Um, coming eight, uh, uh, 2018, the Farm Bill was amended to legalize the cultivation of hemp in the United States and removed hemp and its byproducts from the Controlled Substance Act, which made hemp more accessible here in the United States. The amendment um, it's legal for you at for Ufda, excuse me. With this amendment, it makes it legal for U.S. farmers to grow hemp in commercial use, with the disappointing and racist caveat that anyone previously criminalized for felony related to cannabis use could not apply to grow hemp for at least ten years after their release, despite the fact that cannabis truly is legal across many states here in the United States. Yeah. Even now, hemp continues to face the same barriers we saw in the 1930s stemmed by decades of misinformation, bans, and anti-hemp lobbying. Hemp remains largely misunderstood, expensive, and ex inaccessible. Meanwhile, the government heavily subsidizes fossil fuels, leaving the U.S. truly ill-equipped to produce hemp plastics in a cost-effective and large-scale way in which we need for the future. <clears throat> Talking about the future, in the recent resurgence of hemp in the United States has brought about many economic and environmental benefits. Once a widely used crop within the country, hemp is now returning due to its versatile, versatile nature and numerous applications. JB, you said over, uh, what was it, uh, 50,000? I truly believe that. We can make hemp into multiple things. I, side note, I ran for uh, um, city uh, councilor here in Bemidji back in 2020. And one of my platform planks was hemp toilet paper, building a hemp manufacturing facility to create toilet paper. I wanted to wipe everyone's butt with hemp. I loved it. Not the best campaign <laughs> strategies. Not the best campaign strategies. <laughs> oh, for wow. your ass. <laughs> for your ass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let me uh, shut up. Let me keep uh, going. No <laughs> worries. No worries. Let me move forward. The cultivation of hemp has created new job opportunities and boosted the economy here in the United States where it is legal. Or excuse me, in the states where it is legal. We've seen that. I mean, look at Colorado, that boons with the, the, the taxes coming in from the, the cannabis sales. Mm -hmm. Um. Additionally, the products of hemp pro, um, has opened up new markets and revenue streams for our farmers and entrepreneurs again, which is really important. You know, we want to bring back that manufacturing to the United States. This is how we do it. This is exactly how we do it. And currently, it's China who is producing our hemp products in bulk, in majority. So we need to build those um factories and we need to build those mills now i uh my sister and i attended a hemp conference back in 2022 if i remember right and they were discussing uh, a worker or excuse me a farmer cooperative to grow hemp and they were gonna uh there's still it's still in the works and they have an ideal of making a mill within every hundred mile radius of um, a, a hemp farm. So that means that we're saving, you know, the CO2 offage of transporting that hemp and we're making it more cost effective 
because we don't yeah. have that great of a distance to, to make it or to bring it to production. Mm-hmm. Paper. So like I was talking about the butt wipe, I, you know, one of our biggest boons within the climate and within indigenous country is the deforestation of our forests. I live here in Northern Minnesota. I'm right in the middle of the Chippewa National Forest and right next to us is the Superior National Forest. Our tribal communities, we thrive on lumber, but a lot of our lumberers are, a lot of the folks that go cut down the trees, they don't clear cut. They go in there with specific tags on trees that they need to go and cut down and they pull them out. That's what we need to do to stop this mass clear deforestation of indigenous lands and of Turtle Island. Also, as we'll learn out, uh, learn a little bit later along with the Congo. Um, currently making paper requires cutting down carbon capturing trees that have been growing for decades, sometimes even centuries. Meanwhile, the hemp plant takes up about the same space, or excuse me, a dozen hemp plants take up about the same space as one single tree and can regrow within months rather than decades. Over the course of 20 years, hemp can produce up to 10 times more paper um, than trees per acre while having a much lower environmental impact. Like trees, hemp is carbon capturing, and also nuclear capturing, just saying, I'm just saying, um, which means that during the process of photosynthesis, hemp also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, Most of our experts, I'm outside of that. There, There is a huge conversation to talk about with carbon capturing and the CO2 numbers and the markets and those fucking stupid, pardon the language, those pipelines, those CO2 pipelines. Um, that's for another show, JB. If you want to have me on, we can have we can go ham on those CO2 pipelines yeah. and how BS that we're getting fed with the CO2 markets. Anywho, right. anywho, I, I I get too deep on that. I am completely invested on saving Mama Aki. Mm-hmm. Um, moving towards fuel. You know, we talked about the peanut and the seed oil, Um, corn, tree pulp, and hemp are sources for clean burning alcohol, ethanol, methane, gas. These biofuels contain no sulfur, which is the pollutant that causes acid rain. Growing Mm -hmm. the fuel also produces oxygen to balance out the oxygen consumed during combustion. Engines stay cleaner and the air remains much cleaner. Hemp may also be profitable and produce fuel crops that can grow or can be grown in many areas of America. Hemp can produce about 1,000 gallons of methane per acre, four times as much as can be produced from trees. Fuel can be produced locally, reducing the transportation costs. The production process called biomass conversion is considerably safer and cleaner than fossil fuels. It would create a domestic fuel industry, freeing us from the Middle East oil dependency, providing jobs and keeping our currency here at home. Hemp fuel needs no taxpayer subsidies as oil receives. The Department of Energy estimates that hemp, or that the fuel could be produced from hemp for about 60 cents per gallon. 60 cents per gallon. I mean, we complain about the cost of gas right now. Could you imagine paying 60 cents per gallon for hemp ethanol fuel? Mm. Love it. Yeah. You know, just just to, you know, uh, put some commentary on this because, first off, do people realize how much money there is? and paper products in this country. When you think about it, toilet paper, paper plates, paper cups, um, there is towels, paper towels, right? How, like how much are we using 
just to dry our hands or wipe our behinds, right? These are, we use so much of it. And yet here we have this extremely versatile plant that grows like a weed that is, that doesn't, is not damaging to our planet. And yet we're not utilizing it based on what? <laughs> I want to express that it's not only da not damaging to the planet, Mama Aki, it actually restores and repairs our super fun sites, our nuclear waste sites, our chemical spill sites. Done, and it I'm puts done. the nutrients I'm on, I'm on back my own channel. I'm off my own channel. Because you know what? This, it, it's like, why aren't we funding this? And the primary reason, oh, do not let me go onto a rant on my own show. Because this is, let me sit back down. Oh, take it. Take it. This is your show. I, I want to hear your feedback. I'll give commentary right back to it. Because, like, literally, we could revolutionize the world if we transferred over to hemp. But we choose not to because these corporate colonizers want to keep us locked in this model of extortion and extraction. Mm, mm, mm. <sighs> All right, JB. Hemp was the subject of the 191 conference held in Wisconsin. One of the speakers pointed out our government spends $26 billion each year to pay our farmers not to cultivate their own land. Instead of wasting the taxpayer money, farmers could grow hemp and other fuel crops. This could completely, completely end our foreign um, dependence of oil. Hang on, before you continue, having farmers being able to grow hemp, that would be akin to every farmer having basically an oil pump at each and one in every single one of their farms that's mm -hmm. like you know it's it's like having an oil pump like right there and so like what if everybody what if everybody had access to oil right the price of oil would go down number one and number two you know and nobody would make that much money off of it but even though it's plentiful but here we have a source of energy that is that actually helps improve our environment and is actually healthy for us and it doesn't damage our planet. Oh, this system is so egregious. Please continue. <laughs> um, I love farmers. I, I'm actually third or multi-generational farming family married into a multi-generational farming family. I vibe the farms. Um, over in North Dakota, you will look across North Dakota and see these wind turbines. And a lot of people think that these wind turbines are owned by the electric company. And that's actually not so true. Over in North Dakota, the majority of the wind turbine farms are owned by farmer cooperatives. So those farmers are taking, you know, revenue sources off of that uh, wind power and it's being sold not just to North Dakotans it's being sold to Montanans uh, over into Minnesota where I'm at over into South Dakota it actually covers the, the tri-state area over in North Dakota wind energy so it's amazing I love our farmers and we need to support our farmers more than we're doing now and providing a, an alternative cash crop like hemp will allow for our farmers to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And I foresee a lot of our bankruptcies in our family farms slowing down. Uh, mind you, most of those bankruptcies are due to chickenization and monopolization of that industry. So we need to address that. But hemp will help our farmers get economics, economic stability and um, honestly keep 
um, passing down those farms to family, to family, to family. Um, I love hemp. I'm, I'm, I love the hemp fuel. You know, Henry Ford uh, powered his, his first automobile off of hemp. I want to move a little bit towards something that I really have a passion for, and that's hemp plastic. And while fracking for plastics making, or excuse me, and while fracking for plastic making petroleum contaminates the soil, cultivating hemp can actually remove toxins from the soil it is grown in while reintroducing up to 60% of its nutrients back to the land. What? Oh, we know. How is hemp not being used, JB? During the buildup of the per, of hemp prohibition era, around the same time that colonizing family, the DuPonts, became uh, started creating polymers out of crude oil. These polymers could be cheaply made from fossil fuels and turned into plastics and textiles. They caused, you know, this huge push to restrict the 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 hemp products hemp derived cell, uh, hemp derived plastic and clothing were a competition and because of that the dupont family was one of who is one of the richest families of the time had used their influence in politics to stomp out that industry hemp derived cellulose is strong and durable which remain which while remaining lightweight um hemp plastic can also be molded into different shapes making it plausible for alternatives for electronics dishware storage bins containers furnitures toys makeup bottles bottles this is what my my biggest thing is because we have all these pepsi and coke bottling plants in your town my town all across the united states and if we can transform their plastic into hemp plastic and have it decompose or the ability to decompose within our environment we have just eliminated all that plastic that's running off into the ocean and piling up and making plastic islands for reals jb we currently lack the technology to make too many of these products still over uh 50,000 that you mentioned I, I truly believe that we can get sir, far past that if we actually focused on hemp plastic. And while in 2020, a, a South Dakota University announced a research project meant to explore effective ways of extracting that cellulose from the hemp. Um, with more investments in new technology, we are likely to find more ways to replace harmful plastics with hemp alternatives. And hemp holds up. The cellulose isn't only found within petroleum, it, it's found within, these, within the hemp plants. A complex carbohydrate, also a basic structure element within plant cell walls. Hemp stems, um, contain 60 to 70% cellulose, making them an ideal option to create environmentally friendly cellophane, rayon, and plastic. Unlike petroleum, cellulose, um, hemp cellulose doesn't require fracking or fossil fuels to obtain. It, in contrast, growing hemp takes relatively minimal amount of water with no chemicals, and it also absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. Hemp plastic doesn't replace um, products, or excuse me, hemp plastic doesn't produce any toxic byproducts either. And once hemp plastic product has run its course, it is biodegradable. Unlike most of our plastic nowadays, um, it can remain on our soils for hundred, hundreds of years. Hemp can decompose under the right conditions within just a few months, and it doesn't release any toxins into our air, environment, or water. But hang on, just one moment, hang on. Let me emphasize what I just said there, though. Under the right conditions, because I, I really want to stress this because we have a lot of folks 
buying these hemp biodegradable products or even these plastic um, a petroleum biodegradable products, not knowing that we actually need um, landfills that are designed to handle the uh, biodegradation. And if you're throwing it into your basic landfill, that's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. So we need investment within our local municipalities, creating these landfills to handle the biodegradable plastics, bioplastics, and of course, hemp plastic. Um, I, I wanted to go a little bit on hemp diamonds, and we're going we're gonna to touch that a little bit um, when we talk about Elon Musk. Oh, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Joey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this on full right, right quick. Mm -hmm. As somebody who is has suffered a chronic illness, do you know how much plastic I see on a daily basis? Just as a somebody who has to go to dialysis three days a week. I see plastic everywhere. And imagine just what this would do for the medical industry if they can have hemp plastic when it comes to our IV bags, syringes. How many syringes do hospitals go through, right? Like so many different tools that are used in hospitals. Hell, there's plastic in, in when you when you get your IV, right? It, it, so it's just like that could be used instead. And then on top of it, a lot of people are now talking about microplastics that are now getting within our bodies. So this could also be a huge solving for the. This is we. This is huge, and I don't. I don't know why many people are not. Well, I know why many people aren't talking about this because they're paid not to. But I think that conversations like this need to happen more widely, especially within independent media, because when it comes time for us to truly change this system, and and and, and, and things like that will happen. Like a te a decade will happen within a week's time. Watch. It'll happen. But if we if everybody has this already in mind, so by the time we change the system, we'll go, okay, let's start, let's start going with him. Right? I want this to be in the forefront of everybody's mind when that does happen, when we actually do change the system. Because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And preparation, you know, when you when you're prepared, then when things actually do happen and pop off, then you're ready to go, okay. Now we can implement mass hemp, you know, to go across industries. I just wanted to put that in there, but yeah. Backing up a little bit when you were talking about like plastics for medical use or even plastics for food use. A lot of times we get warnings on our plastics that tell us we can only use it so many times. And that warning is actually there because the, that plastic, the, the chemicals building that plastic will leach into whatever your whatever it's contained or being, you know, holding. Um, one of our huge things is like fresh sellable water and um, you can't have um, water sitting in plastic made out of bio or made out of fuel, fossil fuels, and not expect that to stay um, toxin free and when i talked about hemp plastic being tox uh toxic or uh, not toxic that's what i'm talking about so we can store our water we can store our food we can store our medicines that we give to our elderly and our vulnerable people without the fear that they're going to expire due to chemical contamination from the vest the vessel that we're holding it in is massive thank you so much for telling me that too all right let's continue this is great. um i don't have a little spot for hemp diamonds but let's briefly go into it i don't have anything written up so we're just going off the cuff right now hemp diamonds, hemp diamonds? 
And we're not talking about like ring on the finger diamonds. We're talking about carbon, carbon. And what we use with that carbon is to make um, solar panels. Currently, we're, we are mining and taking precious minerals from the earth to make our solar panels. And that ultimately uh, counterproducts the reason why we're making solar panels, and that's to protect the environment, to reduce emissions. But if you're creating the emissions already to make those solar panels, then you're not, you're not doing anything. Hemp uh, carbon, which is hemp diamonds, has been experimented and is now being used in actual solar panels on the market now. And we can transition away from those minerals and start using hemp to make solar panels. And I, I, I find that so freaking brilliant because you don't only use carbon for solar panels, you use that carbon for your microchips and other electronic needs including um, going further into the batteries. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I, I'm telling you, JB, I love hemp. Do you have any questions? Oh, I got a million questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it really is just more of a statement. Um, when it comes to this system, From what it appears to me is hemp stands to depress a lot of the for-profit industries. And from what I see is a lot of times they don't want hemp to be manufactured in these many different ways because that gatekeeping means that the money keeps flowing into their pockets. And also the manufacturing and growing of hemp also puts more of the resources in the individual individual's hands, not in an individualistic way, but it's basically saying, hey, you have your farm or you have your land where you can grow your hemp and you can make your own fuel, you can make your own different types of uh, resources and plastics and whatever you need, you know, as far as hemp goes. So then you don't need us. And that's what they don't want. They don't want us to not need them because then that means they don't make any money off of us. Um, there's actually something that I wanted to share as well. Uh, this is, I'm just gonna share it really quick. You do this for the sake of time, but I thought I, I had shared this, gosh, I think it was like two years ago, I think I shared this, but I think it's a really uh, fascinating thing. Um, let me share this, yep, found it. So this was a video on YouTube that I shared years ago. And a lot of us were just like, I was just like, wow. So this also has to deal with hemp. So this is a video about hemp blocks. And I was just like, what in the world? You've probably seen this before. But this was Oh my God, I am so sorry. I can't believe I forgot hemp concrete. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh, so my Niji's out there, my indigenous folks out there, don't kill me for like forgetting hemp concrete. And yes, JB. Oh my gosh, um, the lower and upper, uh, the lower Sioux tribe community here in Minnesota, they are creating the, the, or they have created hemp houses made out of hemp concrete. Exactly what you were going into, and I am so sorry. I totally forgot about that. Like I was asked by my sister Gina, don't forget the Lower Sioux Tribe. Get the pictures in there. Um, actor Dallas Goldtooth was a part of that push. I, if I remember right, at least he was in the pictures of the the hemp houses. But we're making houses out of hemp, and it's not just like the the concrete blocks that you're talking about. It's also about the particle board. And mind you, I, I'm conflicted about particle board because like the glue is not where we need it. We need the glue made out of bio glues instead of chemical glues. Um, but particle board itself, you know, that that's basic construction within all of our housing needs and our, our you know, all of that. It's basic construction needs. Um, yeah. the, the hemp blocks themselves, the hemp concrete, as you were, as you try to pull up, 
Those are fire retardants. Those uh, are the best insulators out on the market. And why not? Why not? Our farmers grow that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Go absolutely. Ahead. And so uh, I'm just sharing this as you're talking. Uh, they're literally taking, these are hemp blocks. And like you said, they're fire retarded. They do not burn. Meaning that if it's, if it's set on fire, your house would not burn down. Hmm. This is amazing how, how this just works. And uh, if, if you don't mind, we can just uh, listen to it just for a second. Go for it. Okay. I also want to say they don't just put it in blocks. They what can I love about building print it out. They mm -hmm. can print it out like a 3D printer. Oh, wow. Okay. It's, and that's how some communities are making homes and buildings out of it. Okay. Let, okay, go on. These blocks is, it's like Lego for adults. That's what everybody can relate to. Hempcrete is a great insulator. It's fire resistant. It's easy to build with, and it's good for the environment. By the way, hang on. I want you guys to look at this. As this guy is literally burning it, he's not wearing a fire resistant glove on the other side of that. Did you guys notice that? <laughs> he literally has a torch, and it's in between that and his hand. Now, if you have regular wood, I would be scared to death to have my hand behind that. But he literally has his bare hand behind the fire, and between it is a hemp block. That it, it looks like it's probably about maybe two, maybe two and a half inches thick. That's it. That just goes to show how confident he is in hemp being fire resistant. Wouldn't you want your house to be built with this stuff? Oh, and that's a byproduct. That, that's not even like the, the, the main innards of the hemp plant. That's the byproduct? Yep, that's just the husks. This is wild, man. The, the inner product is used in makeups and uh, like creating the, the carbon, all that cool stuff. Wow. This is just so interesting. And, and, and part of me just wants to think like how this would change even the price of housing mm. in our world. For instance, because I'm a firm believer in housing for, for everybody, right? I think housing is a human right. It should just be given to everybody just for by virtue of you being a human being because everybody deserves housing. And people will go, well, that will be too expensive. Not if we do it all with him. Mm. Not if we do it all with hemp. Not no. if we, you know, not not to get into politics, but I like Jasmine Sherman's um, housing policy. Okay. And if you check that out, uh, Sabby did an interview of her back in September, but it was more of like a B and B app type of setup. Um, the government went in and purchased all would purchase all the houses. Um, compensate everyone who you know paid into it and then um, if you choose to move just go on the app set up where you want to live and uh, it will give you a stipend to help you move and give you the available listings that are open simple easy as that um, I think that even with Jasmine's uh, model we're gonna end up making a lot of houses and rather than using uh, wood, which is one of the leading causes of deforestation, let's be real, we should be using hemp, which our farmers would love. They could make a lot more money quicker if they, you know, grew hemp instead of the trees. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah.
more head kisses and have a beautiful day.